Wednesday morning, by the way. Um, thanks for tuning in this morning to our two special ones. We got one this weekend, well, this week and next week uh, for our candidate forums. And of course, this week we're featuring uh, the candidates uh, from the riding of Cambridge. Next week, we will we'll have Kitchener uh, South Hespler. Uh, but you know what I really like about Chamber Chat the best, the very best, is I get to see some really happy and some really miserable people first thing in the morning. It's uh, it's really interesting how people wake up and what they look like, because uh, when that camera comes on and I, you know, I know all of you that got your camera blocked off, you're doing that because you, you don't want to show that miserable face, but that's okay, you can, if you want, we're all friends here and we all want to know what kind of mood you're in on Wednesday mornings. Uh, it's halfway through the week and why not uh, eh, just show us what you're feeling this week, whether you've had a good week, a bad week, or uh, maybe even a great week. Anyway, welcome to today's session um, where we have uh, the candidates for the Cambridge Riding, as I said. Um, and I think I'll take a, a moment here. We're gonna have, this is gonna be a very unique uh, uh, version of our candidates uh, meetings. We're actually having our board members, some of our board members, five of them actually are gonna be asking questions. And I'm just gonna ask that they maybe uh, kind of put their hand up and wave when I introduce them. Uh, Kristen Danson is our chair elect and she is the owner uh, and managing partner of Mitographics and uh, Swift Components. Terry Kratz uh, is uh, our resident accountant uh, from Henrik Flanagan Kratz, McCray and a whole bunch of other guys that are partners with him. Um, but he is also the treasurer of our board of directors, Peter Voss. Uh, a lot of people know Peter Voss. Peter is the president and CEO of Shimco. Uh, he is in the aerospace industry, and he is also a board member uh, for the chamber. And uh, Prakash Venkatarium, uh, uh, he is just waved there, Prakash. Everybody knows Prakash. You've met him in some form or another. Um, he is also uh, on our board of uh, directors. And Darren Drulard is the chair of our board of directors. Uh, and he is a, uh, a senior manager at uh, Powerline Logistics. Actually, I call him the brains and the brawn of Powerline Logistics. And he accepts it graciously, uh, as does uh, the owner. But uh, anyway, thank you very much to the board members for coming in and participating in this. Now I want to introduce to you the candidates uh, that you'll hear from today. Of course, the incumbent. Uh, and Liberal candidate, Brian May. Brian, give us a little wave there. Um, uh, from the Conservative Party, Connie Cody. Connie, give us a little bit of a wave. From the New Democratic Party, uh, Lauren Bruce. Lauren, give us a little bit of a wave. And uh, from the Green Party, I think, I don't know how many times, Michelle Braniff, that we have uh, uh, been doing this, but it's been a number of times. It's good to see you again. It's Michelle Braniff from the Green Party. Give us a little wave there. And uh, Maggie Sigornis from the PPC, uh, she was invited. Everybody has been invited um, and uh, did not respond to the invitation. So... We'll go from there, but I first wanted to make a, uh, a, a little bit of a statement. The recent events surrounding uh, Mr. Trudeau's uh, visit to Cambridge, um, I, I certainly hope everybody feels was appalling, embarrassing, and senseless to say the very least. I think it, it just, it, it doesn't demonstrate what uh, we in a democracy and uh, in, in Canada in particular, certainly want to show. Regardless of how you feel about any person or political party, disgusting commentary, threats, and demeaning statements are no way to get your message out. You know, I've been sitting in that chair, and when those actions come forward, I can tell you the hearing aid gets turned right off. It's not a way to get your message across. You want to get your message across. Let's have dialogue. Let's have debate. And, and let's bring reason to the table. The vast majority of people want civility, energetic, but respectful debate and, uh, debate and a political system that encourages uh, opposing sides to come together to, to form better legislation in the end. That's really what a democracy is, and that's what we expect as those of us who are voting in every election. It's ridiculous, and this should be condemned in the strongest of fashions from every single party and candidate that's running. You're entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. How will you as a local candidate operate is probably uh, the best 
question to ask, but we'll leave it to my board to ask the most inspiring questions and interesting questions from a, the perspective of uh, a local member of parliament. We are gonna give each candidate a couple of minutes to answer each question. And uh, we're gonna go through a variety of questions, whether it be healthcare, pandemic, financial, uh, environment, um, everything along the way, possibly we'll even get to some housing as well if we have some time. And then at the very end, I'll keep watching. We're gonna go to probably around 1030. I'm gonna leave um, about four or five minutes at the end for each candidate uh, to give their one minute little hurrah on why uh, you should be considering them as our next uh, member of parliament. So with that, we're gonna start. Uh, I just gotta get my timer set up here. Otherwise somebody's gonna complain. I gave one person too many minutes and another person too little minutes. So let's start off with Kristen Danson with the first question. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for letting me be here and, and ask my question. Um, if elected, it would be your responsibility to set up and operate the local constituency office for our community. How do you plan to improve on the conventional approach to this community hub to better serve business? What commitments are you willing to make to turn this office into a place where meaningful dialogue between yourself and business leaders would be assured to take place throughout the length of your service? Thank you. Let's start off with Michelle. Hello, I'm glad to be here. Um, I think uh, you know, part of my background is I was a mediator and a, and a team builder um, and I got a lot of curiosity. So I think um, you know, there's an aspect of um, re reaching out, making people feel uh, welcome, hospitality, meeting them. It, in many ways, it's more challenging to do that in a pandemic. On the other hand, there's the, the, the technology and, and the create, uh, creative ways of meet, meeting in terms of Zoom. So uh, I think I would ask, I would probably consult people at the chamber and uh, try to get invited uh, to, to events where I might start to develop relationships. Um, I think uh, it's all about people, it's all about relationships and um, the, developing those relationships uh, would be, uh, would, would be uh, important, continuing to uh, further develop them. Well, thanks very much, Michelle. If you are elected, you're gonna, we're gonna drive you crazy with invites to events. So you're gonna have lots of opportunity to do that. Um, let's go to Lauren Bruce now from the NDP. Thanks, Greg, uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the chamber. Uh, we know the challenges that we've been all facing uh, during a pandemic election. So any platform we can get out and talk to folks is uh, very much appreciated. And the second thing I'd like to say before we get into the questions is I'd like to congratulate all the other candidates on our nomination and representing their parties. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian, about the events that happened at your uh, event here in Cambridge. Uh, you know, we know each other and uh, I felt for you, brother. So. So back to setting up a constituency office, uh, I believe in having regular round tables and I have an open door policy. Uh, one of the biggest communication factors I find is listening. So as the business community or other community uh, organizations, uh, we need to set up a regular round table, open door, people can come and voice their concerns. Terrific. Connie Cody from the Conservative Party. Good morning. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for inviting me to the uh, chamber chat and uh, thank you, Greg, for your comments this morning. I think it's important that you acknowledge what happened and uh, you're absolutely correct that uh, those things, I would not promote or condone any type of uh, protest that occurred. So uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, you know, as, as a lifelong member of this community and advocate, uh, I've come to realize the um, the challenges that we face here, and especially the challenges for the business community and our essential workers. And uh, I also want to thank those uh, essential workers and our first line workers and community volunteers for all their hard work during uh, during this pandemic. I think without them that uh, things would be much harder. And uh, for me, I, I represent uh, an on the ground lead by example style of leadership. And um, 
The members of this business community are important here and to international trade, and they shouldn't have to work so hard to be heard. Um, I guess during our toughest times, that's when government representatives need to keep their offices open and available to help their community. I feel it's very important to have uh, someone um, available to respond. And for me, I always feel that it's important to conduct uh, myself with integrity. And while I recognize there are significant challenges that we all face, I'm willing to uh, work hard, roll my sleeves up and uh, be a strong representative to support the vision of our businesses and uh, our community. We have to realize that um, small business is the engine of our economy and we deserve a government that is acting on their behalf. And for me, the Conservatives want to increase long-term economic growth to create more jobs and put our government finances on a stable footing. Thank you, Connie. And now we'll go to Brian May from the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting this once again. Uh, it's, uh, it's really special to be able to do this, uh, to do this virtually. Um, the question is about how we're gonna connect with, with businesses in our community in a, in a better fashion. And I, and I say, can say that uh, for the last six years or so, um, I have I've absolutely strived to, to get out and, and communicate with uh, businesses, to consult with businesses. We've hosted countless town halls, uh, consultations. Greg, you and I have been in many roundtable discussions uh, as we were able to bring in ministers uh, to discuss uh, the needs of, of small businesses. And of course, we would continue to do that. Um, uh, one of the things that is, is often missed uh, in some of these discussions is the reality that, uh, yes, you're, you're going to be Cambridge's voice in Ottawa, but really it comes down to service in the community. The overwhelming majority of the job is supporting people in the community, whether it's individuals or businesses. And what I found very critical for our success is making sure we didn't necessarily hire political people uh, and, and try to train them on, on service. We actually, in, in my office, we everybody in my office has a background in service. And this is my background. I, of course, worked in the Y, uh, Boys and Girls Club. This is, this is widely known by now um, and, and really come from a, a place of service. Um, we, need to, we need to continue to be accessible. And this past year and a half, of course, has been incredibly challenging for everybody. Um, but I'm very proud to say that uh, we, we have always remained open. There's always somebody answering the phone. We've been virtual but it has not interrupted our ability to serve this community and, and to serve the business community in, in Cambridge. Um, and I think moving forward, we've got to establish, like you have here, Greg, uh, the technology that we now have at our fingertips that has become very critical over the last uh, year and a half uh, and make sure that we're continuing to use it to, to the best of our ability and, and stay connected with businesses. Uh, I, I look forward to continue to develop those relationships with the businesses in Cambridge over the next four years. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And uh, question number two, Terry Krotz. Thanks, Greg, and welcome. Good morning, everybody. Glad to participate. Um, I guess it, uh, my question was, was just about, um, other than our, our current governing party, there's been a lot of criticism from other parties on how some of the response to, to the pandemic uh, has been. And I just was wondering what uh, your impressions would be of, of what was wrong and, and what might have you done, done differently? Thanks. Okay, let's start with Connie Cody. Well, that's a, that's a good question. And um, I guess, we have to uh, look at our plan. The Conservative has come up with a good plan two days after the uh, writ. And uh, it's very simple. And I guess the message is that we need to be prepared and take rapid action so that we protect the health of the Canadians while avoiding the long-term impacts on the economy and mental health. And we wanna make uh, Canada more resilient. We wanna reduce the reliance on foreign countries and take seriously the responsibility to protect the health of all Canadians. So going forward, we will overhaul Canada's pandemic plan and preparedness to include a focus on infectious diseases and bioterrorism threats rather than solely on influenza. And we will work to strengthen the supply chain to reduce our shared reliance on imports. 
And there's uh, also part of the plan is to overhaul Canada's national emergency stockpile system. Those are all good things that uh, will help to strengthen health Canada to ensure it can rapidly review crucial innovations like new tests and treatments and vaccines. So all in all, I think those are all things to uh, move forward with for uh, if we ever come across something like this again. Terrific, thank you. Uh, let's go to Lauren Bruce. Oh, <clears throat> Terry, thank you for the question. Uh, as a frontline worker uh, providing essential services, I work in a grocery store. I've worked for Zaire for 35 years. So very customer service oriented. And I was very disappointed by the initial reaction when the pandemic first hit. We all remember when the, the Ontario government finally made the announcement to close schools, we were completely overrun. Um, I was surprised at how ill-prepared we were. Uh, if those of us remember the SARS outbreak and the recommendations that came out of that uh, situation. And, uh, you know, the governments didn't really pay attention to those recommendations because right off the hop, I was, you know, yelling from the rooftops, where are the PPE? What's the protocol? What's this? What are we going to do to protect our people, the workers, because we're going to be inundated? And I, I, I don't believe for a second that government officials didn't realize that when you had a shutdown like that, you knew that grocery stores and pharmacies would be open. It would be the only thing would be open, right? I mean, you'd have the, the uh, hydro guys working and the, and the, and the power companies and the, and the firefighters and the first responders, but you also have grocery stores because people need food. And we were ill prepared for it. And I kept asking questions, like, what are we going to do? What's, what's, what's happening here? What's the mass protocol? So uh, I think moving forward, I think we need to take lessons from this. I was heartened to see that all the political parties in Canada got together and, and realized that we need to work together to get through this. So we, you know, we, we passed some extraordinary measures to deal with extraordinary times. But the official response was uh, less than stellar, in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Lauren. How about uh, Brian May? Thank you, Greg. And and this is a this is sort of a crystal ball question, right? Like, what could we do if we had a crystal ball and 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 known what was coming? The reality is, we we didn't. We had uh, we had uh, very little knowledge in terms of what was the long term issues here. And and Lauren brings up a really good point about uh, the PPE. The Ontario government allowed uh, for uh, the entire stockpile of PPE to expire. Uh, prior to COVID, it's, it's, it's important to understand that 0% of the uh, uh, personal protective equipment was, was made in Canada. Um, what our government did in, in reaching out to uh, businesses and, 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 uh, and, and companies all across Canada in, that, in those early days saying, are you able to pivot? Are you able to, to make this stuff? And do you have stuff that we can buy? And in one weekend, we had 5,000 e uh, emails from companies. People like uh, Eclipse Automation uh, standing up and, and, and uh, getting completely out of their comfort zone and making N95 masks right here in Cambridge. We now have 54% of the PPE that we're consuming is made here in Canada. Um, this is something we absolutely have to learn from and we cannot, we cannot uh, lose those, those messages. Um, I think that it's, it's important to recognize that as the, the uh, pandemic proceeded, as it continued to get worse, uh, the, cha the changes that we saw in our supports. And Greg, you know perfectly well, we had those conversations about the wage subsidy not being strong enough in the early days. We listened, we consulted with, with a lot of businesses like the chambers and, and uh, made that wage subsidy 75%, which supported 5 million Canadian, Canadian workers to keep their jobs. Thank you, Brian. And Michelle Braniff. I wanted group. to thank you, uh, Terry, for being a, a devil's advocate. You, you phrased that question in a way that really was tempting for us to go and point fingers at one another and, and do that uh, old days politics as usual that's very adversarial. Um, Green Party, we, we collaborate, we work together. Um, and, and I was, you know, I think there was great uh, collaboration so we did that well, um, pivoting. Um, what one of the things we learned is, is you know, lots of times the Green Party is saying this needs to change and that needs to change, and 
And it's like, well, it's a big ship, ship. it turns slowly. Pandemic showed us we can, we can turn more quickly than we believe. So there's a whole lot of strengths. And I think it's important as Canadians to build on those strengths in our society, in our business community, in, in, uh, in, in locally, and, and, and how um, you know, politically um, the parties all work together. I think that the pandemic did highlight a lot of weaknesses in our systems and, and some of my, uh, um, my friends, Connie and, and uh, Lauren have, you know, have talked about that and, and Brian acknowledges as well. Yeah, we, we need to have um, local supply, local manufacture. I think the um, importance of public health um, is is confirmed. We need to we need to reinforce that, invest that. We relied so heavily on public health at that time. We need to rely on science, so we need investment for for the future. This is not the last pandemic, um, and it's not over yet. So so we need to you know we need to invest in science, and uh, we need to have community primary care as as an essential link there that. Uh, that we've had a lot of uh, underinvestment um, in, in healthcare generally. Um, the funding formula needs to change, and and uh, you know long term care as well. So there's places where we have seen the weaknesses, not necessarily only with respect to the pandemic, but those weaknesses were highlighted in the pandemic, and we need to be smarter as we go forward and and learn. So so we're we've got to be better tomorrow than we were uh, the last time on. Terrific, thank you, Michelle. Okay, Peter Voss. Good morning, everybody. Uh, mine's a little more technical question because I'm a CPA, so I can get a little more technical. Um, it seems inevitable that uh, whatever party does come into power, um, we'll, they'll likely uh, want to see how they can increase revenues to pay down, uh, pay down some of the debt. You know, while well, the pandemic is responsible for much of the debt recently, we've also been running massive debts um, over the uh, past six years. It just keeps adding to the burden. So you can imagine that we're all worried uh, how we'll be taxed even more than, than we are and how we'll be able to maintain our standard of living, which has been declining over the last five or six years. And I believe uh, many, many of us have heard about the internal liberal memo that was uh, considering the taxation of our silver primary residents. Um, so it's obviously very worrying. Um, so the question is, uh, does your party plan to increase the capital gains inclusion rate above 50% uh, that is now? And if so, will certain things be excluded, such as the gain on your principal residence and the sale of your uh, small business? Let's start off with uh, the NDP, Lauren Bruce. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for your question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I look at, uh, when you talk about taxation, you know, I look at the, the past, say, 30 or 40 years or so, we've seen a huge shift. And uh, I'll use the term tax burden, but, but we're, what I'm really saying is uh, to pay for the services we, that we rely on, whether you're a business or you're an individual, that we've seen that shift to the individual. You know, you've quite often heard that uh, there's only one taxpayer pocket, right? Well, um, you know, and I'm not talking about medium to small businesses and the, and the local business community. I'm talking about the large conglomerates, the international companies that are not paying their fair share. You know, the tax loopholes. Uh, you know, the convenience store on the, on the corner is not putting their money in a tax haven. That's not what we're talking about, right? So um, that's where the revenue, because quite often when I hear uh, the other parties talk about, uh, you know, debt, taxation, recovery, whatnot, I don't hear anything about revenue streams or revenue. I hear, you know, hopefully the economy is going to, you know, grow and we'll, we'll get the revenue that way, right? I'm a cautious uh, optimist when it comes, when I look at growth in the economy and, and relying on those revenues. But uh, what we're talking about is, is a more of a fair system and, and getting the, the really big players to pay, pay their fair share. Because like I said, if you look at the history of taxation, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot, the, the shift was a lot more the other way. And we were still uh, very, very prosperous. Okay, thank you, Lauren. And Brian May. Thank you, Peter, uh, for the question. And I thank you for the opportunity to, to correct the record on this uh, very clearly. Uh, the Liberal government is not going to tax uh, primary residents, sale of primary residences. 
we have to understand where this is this is coming from. This is something that the conservatives, not just this election, but last election, were trying to trying to scare people into into thinking that this is something we were going to do. Um, I'm sure many of you have been involved in policy conventions. This was a policy convention uh, uh, recommendation that was brought forward by one individual in, in from Adam Vaughn's riding years ago, and it was handed, handily defeated uh, at the policy convention. Um, the fact that that this is still something that we have to, uh, de to defend is, is kind of ridiculous. Um, this is, uh, so I, I hope we can put that to, to rest. The question about deficit is, is really important as well. Um, prior to, to pandemic, uh, we were actually seeing the deficits decreasing every year prior to the deficit. Our plan is, was working. Um, and, and quite frankly, we, we're the only party that has a costed plan moving forward. It's the only platform that is, that is currently costed by the PBO. Um, another thing just to, to remember, uh, there, is, there, there was criticism throughout this, throughout this uh, process uh, from, from specifically the Conservatives that we're doing, you know, we're, we're, we're spending too much money, we're doing this, we're doing that. Um, there was a very interesting report from the IMF that came out in March that, that highlighted Canada's COVID response and the work that we did. And what it theorized is that we, if we hadn't have done uh, the things that we did, the, the, the SIBA loans, the, 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 the CERB, the, the wage subsidies, all of those things, if we hadn't have done them, our deficit would have been almost identical because all those people would have ended up on EI, businesses would have, would have gone bankrupt without those, without those supports. All of those revenue streams that are currently still going in to the federal government would be gone. And so it's, it, you know, this is what we needed to do. And Canada had the best economic uh, uh, support system in the world for its businesses and its citizens. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Michelle. So I can say to the, uh, the part of your question about taxing principal residents, absolutely not. Um, that's that's never been part of any policy of the of the uh, of the Green Party of Canada. Um, to the second part of your question, you know, how do we pay for it? And what do we do with a deficit? Um, it's important to recognize that uh, we, we have a tendency with government to only look at an income statement. Like if, 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 if you were running a business, you would have a balance sheet and you would look at the balance sheet. And if you were running a business, you wouldn't only look at one part of the business. You know, you wouldn't allow the business to download everything to, to one branch and have them pay for more than their share. So the Green Party is in favor of true cost accounting, uh, true accounting, where we, we recognize that it's not just about the revenue stream and the, and the money that's spent each year, we have to look at infrastructure. And there are places where the pandemic indicated serious uh, infrastructure deficits. Um, if we'd had a balance sheet, we would have you know, we would we we would have seen that those some of these assets were no longer assets anymore, um, and so and so it's important to to make sure that we we you know we 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 need to look at government um, the way government it's not always spending money. There are ways to invest money, and um, during a pandemic, with the risks that we face, that were both health and financial, we, we, needed, to, we needed to invest um, rather than spend. That, that does mean that uh, you know, the revenue part of your question is, is, is accurate. And, um, and, and to the extent that taxation is used um, from the Green Party point of view, it needs to be done in a way that is, is looking at the incentives and looking at what you're trying to, uh, to end. So there, there are no um, uh, policy benefits from, from taxing principal residents. Um, to the extent we have a problem with the housing market, the recommendations based on research um, are more to do with speculation than ordinary people who you know, live, in, live in a house for a long time. Thanks very much, Michelle. And Connie Cody from the Conservative Party.
Uh, another good question. Um, the Canada Conservatives uh, have no plans to ever tax the uh, Canadian capital gains on the sale of the principal uh, property. And um, the other thing is that the, uh, the employees deserve the opportunity to um, earn more than just a salary for their hard work. We have to make sure that people have more money in their pockets to uh, move forward. And they also deserve uh, greater security in their retirement. And the Conservatives will increase employee ownership of Canadian companies by establishing the Employee Ownership Trust, which will provide a tax advantage for company owners to uh, sell to their employees. And this would actually take the form of our, a reduction in capital gains tax when the owner sells to a trust owned by the employees, enabling ownership to transfer to the people who have partnered in building the business. And uh, we also want to ensure that uh, financing is available to support all these uh, trusts. So, um, it's, you know, we have to, uh, because there's one encourage the laws and policies to boost the economy, economy and uh, make life more affordable for everyone. We have to remember that we don't want to uh, build the burden on our future generations to come. And uh, the Conservatives have got us out of the last recession and we can uh, do it again. Thanks, Connie. Okay, Darren Drillard, Chair of the Board from Powerline Logistics. Thank you, Greg, and uh, thank you for attending everybody this morning. Uh, appreciate all the comments thus far. Um, for my question, over the years, we've seen a troubling rise in ethics issues and scandals at all levels of government, but especially within the federal ranks. Uh, in, the in the private industry, if an employee goes against the ethics of their company or community, they often lose their job or can face hefty fines or even jail time. At the federal government level, current penalties are more equitable to a parking ticket and clearly do not deter an elected official from crossing ethical lines or boundaries. At this point, one party has publicly added stronger ethics controls to their platform. Can each of you please comment on how your party, if elected, will ensure a high level of ethics will be, uh, a high level of ethics will be promoted and how you will hold yourselves and other current and future elected leaders accountable to ethics policies? Start with Brian May. Thank you uh, for that question. And this is this has really uh, been something that uh, obviously uh, the opposition has focused on this past year. And and I have to say, uh, the amount of time and energy that was put into uh, a number of different issues uh, that ultimately ended up not actually uh, being a quote unquote scandal. Uh, the the we have an ethics commission. Uh, that does their job. We respect that they need to do their job, and we have, you know, we have we have a system in place uh, to follow up on these things. And I and I think it's it's fascinating to me that during a worldwide pandemic, uh, instead of focusing on Canadians, instead of focusing on on what we needed to do to get people through this as safely as possible, the opposition wanted to focus on Justin Trudeau. And, and it, it, the mudslinging that I saw this past year was unlike I, anything I've ever seen. And one of the things that we, we need to really readdress is, is, is focusing in on parliament. Um, you know, I've talked, knocked on a lot of doors over the, last, uh, over the last number of weeks. Folks are not talking about we, they're not. They're talking about how do we get out of this pandemic? How do we get out of, of, of this economic situation that we're in? And that's what is concerning Canadians. That's what we're going to continue to work for. There are systems in place to deal with issues if they arise. What I find very egregious is the filibustering by all party, all parties uh, in opposition to bills such as uh, C6, to bills uh, such as um, the, the, our environmental platforms, um, uh, ban on, 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 on certain firearms, conversion therapy, that the fact that there is obstruction going on right now because they want to make Justin Trudeau look bad, this is not how Parliament should be functioning. And I think it's it's really quite egregious that um, the opposition really continue down this road where, uh, quite frankly, it does not help the people of Cambridge, doesn't help the people of Canada. Thank you, Brian. Uh, let's go to uh, Lauren Bruce from the NDP. Well, <clears throat> when it comes to personal ethics, I like to think I hold myself to a high standard because I have to answer to 
the people I represent and uh, my own family. So as a father of two, uh, I like to think that I conduct myself in a respectful manner towards others. Um, and the NDP at the federal level already has uh, procedures in place to deal with uh, issues that arise. And also, uh, just as an aside, is that all the NDP staff are actually unionized. So they also have representation that way. So if something were to occur, they, all, they have the grievance procedure, they have the, uh, all of those tools, of, tools available to them so that they can be tr treated fairly and with respect. So I think that's an important uh, uh, thing to point out for our staff on the Hill. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Let's go to Connie Cody. You're on mute, Connie. It didn't click, sorry about that. Um, in 2006, in response to the Liberal Party sponsorship scandal, Conservatives brought forward the toughest piece of anti-corruption legislation in Canadian history, which is called the Federal Accountability Act. Unfortunately, the current government has shown that these uh, rules didn't go far enough. And the Conservatives want to have accountability. We're tired of the division and the Liberals don't seem to be listening. And uh, basically the systems aren't uh, strong enough. So what we would like to do is introduce stricter laws to require ethics in government. Uh, for me personally, that's very important. We wanna prevent a lot of the cover-ups and uh, ensure that there's a lot more transparency and accountability and that uh, all the lobbying is uh, adequately uh, transparent. And, um, you know, for all of us, I think that uh, Canadians and our community is uh, deserving of a government that acts on uh, their behalf. And, um, you know, lots of governments are always talking about we, but uh, it doesn't show it when it doesn't represent for all Canadians and all people. And that's something that Conservatives want to make sure is that the people trust the government and uh, transparency and accountability and the ethics is a very strong thing that Conservatives will promote. Thanks, Connie. And Michelle. So um, I agree that um, ethics and accountability and transparency are important. It, it's actually fundamental to a democracy. Um, I, uh, I, I believe that uh, education and rules and guidelines and offices are all important and relevant. Um, I think what we need to do is zoom out a little bit and look at the, uh, the wider culture and the wider systems. So uh, we, we have problems in Canada. Um, we have um, huge challenges with the Indigenous people in terms of systems and um, you know colonialism and racism and cultural imperialism. Um, we have recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation from a Royal Commission back to 1996. So, so, so those larger um, cultural issues where there's disparity and unfairness, those need to be addressed. Um, it's, it's very difficult to be a person of color in Canada, especially with police issues, those issues need to be addressed. Um, you know, I've said before in debate, debates, it's, it's quite lovely that now as a woman, I can make about 55, 60% of what men earn. So I'm, 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 I'm grateful, but I'd like to think my granddaughter may have more of an equal shot, that my granddaughter may be in a workplace that would be free from sexual harassment and, in, instead of having to sit defensively. <laughs> so I, 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 think, I think rather than just focus on parliament, um, yeah, we need safeguards, but I, I think it would be naive not to not to recognize that there are injustices and social inequities going on in larger society, and we can we can uh, we can certainly focus and address those, and we should. Thank you, Michelle, very much. Okay, now next question, Prakash. Had to wake Prakash up there. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> good. <laughs> Very good morning to you all. Uh, so my question today to all of you, first of all, thank you for putting your name up and it's not easy. Thanks for everything you do. So my question today is related to immigration work and a small and medium business entrepreneurs. Any business today looking for staff are having very difficult time. Especially until last week, like uh, there were a lot of students working full-time jobs. And this week, the universities and schools have started. So those students are going to convert into part-time. So that is going to create major issues on the ground starting from this week. The current government promised 400,000 immigrants per year in 2021. And for the next three years, it's going to be 1.2 million immigrants coming into Canada. But as of July 1st, 2021, we have little more than 30,000 being granted access. So out of 400,000, we got only 30,000 halfway through the year. And majority of students are refugees. And there seems to be some balance in immigration based on the need of the ground. The temporary foreign worker program has restrictions and a process that doesn't at all serve small and medium sized businesses. We appreciate it may work for large business, but they represent less than 1% of all employer business in Canada. What would be your plans to help business navigate through this nearly impossible time at getting more staff? Would you work with business community to develop a temporary foreign worker program that would meet small and medium enterprise needs? That is the first part of it. The second part is balanced immigration. So we seem to see get like more students and refugees uh, coming uh, on board. And uh, we are getting more people looking for a job. We are not getting a lot of people providing opportunities so are we, is your party, if the farm government would be interested in uh, promoting entrepreneurs to relocate to Canada? So as we need more people uh, looking for a job and also we need more people who could create opportunities for those people. So the balanced immigration aspect, what is your thought process on it? How are we going to address that? Thank you. Okay, let's start with Connie Cody. try and meet this time. <laughs> um, well, immigration is a very important topic to address. I agree. It's uh, something that uh, uh, a lot of people immigrated to this country. We're based a lot on immigration, and uh, this is where a lot of our growth has come from. The reality is that it's quite irresponsible to bring in over 400,000 new citizens without ever planning their housing and employment needs first. This only compounds our current housing crisis and uh, homelessness. Those who wish to come to Canada deserve a plan that provides uh, clarity and a process that treats them with dignity, compassion, and respect. And the conservative plan is uh, to launch a credential recognition task force that will help newcomers maximize their success by allowing them to work in their field, which is not only good for Canada, but for our economy. We need to streamline the overall process, uh, which will help to bring more entrepreneurs to our country, because with more entrepreneurs, we create a stronger economy and uh, with more and better paying jobs. As well, the Conservatives plan to launch the Rebuild Main Street tax credit, which will give a strong incentive for Canadians to invest their money to help entrepreneurs rebuild our country. Um, Investment has been driven out of our country for, for quite a while now, and our party wants to make Canada the best place to invest and build a business to get the economy moving. We will introduce the competition laws that will prevent a few companies from dominating whole industries and uh, pushing up prices. The, uh, the other thing that we want to do is create opportunities with the skilled trades and apprenticeship programs. That's something else that has been lacking a lot for our youth. We have to concentrate more on the uh, colleges and trades because they offer great paying jobs. So overall, I think with the conservative plan that it's very detailed and simplified and it's to get more people working and more people housing. And this way we can contribute and boost our economy all across Canada. Thanks, Connie. Let's go to Michelle Branham. 
Thank you. Um, this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, I, uh, I spent many years as a, uh, a business advisor in one of the programs was for new Canadians. So uh, in fact, my current family doctor uh, started a little business doing acupuncture and uh, um, it did take uh, over 10 years and she had to go to, to get her board. She wrote it once and she wrote it again. She had to go to New Brunswick to get an internship. That has improved, but there, there's, there's sure plenty of room for improvement. So um, we don't need a task force on uh, foreign trade uh, professionals. And uh, because there is, is, are lots of bodies of research and policy papers and recommendations out there, what we need is, is a national credentials. And we need people in their country of origin to know what to be able to do the credentialing before they come to Canada, because what's happening is we actually have, um, we have professionals, we have skilled trades, we have entrepreneurs coming here. And um, uh, Brian and I have had discussion about that. I think Brian would agree that one of the difficulties is, is this industry offshore where they take money and um, it, it, we need to, to, you know, eliminate that and, and, and have government control so that the, there's national standards for accreditation for professionals for for the skilled trades so that we can expedite when these qualified people arrive in Canada getting them into the workforce so uh, so that certainly needs to happen there also has uh, been um, you know gradually less and less funding the transfers from the federal government government to the provinces in education, health and social services have, have, have not kept pace to the need. As someone who teaches at a, at a community college, um, there, there does need to be more investment in post-secondary education. The, the colleges do a lot of training for skilled trades. I can also tell you that I had a student who came from India and he was learning uh, in a course for social service workers his goal was to become a truck driver. Um, that's what he wanted to do and good for him. But and yeah. so I think one of the things we need to do is be able to fast track these international students, fast track temporary workers, people who are in Canada, who are part of the workforce, you know, they're, 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 they're already integrating into the Canadian economy. How do we fast track them? How do we make this young man's dream come true of being a long distance trucker in Canada? because the truckers, uh, the trucking industry in Canada needs him. Such I write a story. reference for him too. But it's such good story. So I let you go over just a little bit there, Michelle, but uh, um, okay, let's go to Brian Bay. Thank you, Greg. And, and thank you, Prakash. Uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things I'm hearing uh, when, I'm, when I'm communicating with businesses, whether it's my local coffee shop or, or Toyota, uh, we can't find enough skilled people. We can't find enough uh, enough folks to to do to do the work that uh, is necessary. And there's a number of factors. Immigration is definitely one of them. Aging population is another one. Um, we have uh, uh, you know an issue uh, with the temporary foreign system that for sure. And I know a little bit about this uh, as the uh, former chair of the Human Resources, Skills and Social Development and Status of People with Disabilities Committee. One of the first things we did when when I was elected was study. Uh, and, and bring forth uh, 19 recommendations uh, with the temporary foreign worker program. And we, we really transformed that, that system. We got rid of the four in, four out rule, which was uh, quite crippling to, to uh, workers that were actually looking to, uh, to become citizens. And, and I think that, um, you know, to your point, Prakash, about the uh, 30,000 uh, number opposed to 400,000, a lot of that is as a result of the fact that we, over the last year and a half, have extended and created pathways to people that are here on those temporary foreign systems or student systems to stay here and become citizens. And that's what we're gonna to continue to do. We're gonna we're going to make it easier for temporary foreign workers and, and foreign students to stay in Canada. Uh, we're gonna extend pathways to them um, and, and uh, through the, the express entry point system. Um, we're also, our, our platform talks about reaching out to find 2000 skilled refugees to fill labor shortages in demand sectors, such as healthcare. Um, and we're, we're looking to create what's called a trusted employer system to streamline the application process for Canadian companies, make it easier, make it more accessible. Um, so small businesses don't have to go through this, this uh, 
large, rigorous process, uh, which, which costs them time, which they don't have, and money, which they don't have. Um, and we're going to uh, it improve uh, the global talent stream program to allow Canadian companies to attract and hire those skilled workers that they need. Um, we're going to continue to work with the provinces and territories and regulatory bodies to improve uh, the foreign credential recognition program. This has been a long-standing problem that you know you hear taxi drivers with medical degrees. We've got to find a solution for these things. Um, and and quite frankly, COVID has played a major role. In, in not being able to bring over uh, the 400,000 number that we're, we're talking about. We got to be very careful with that regard in regarding uh, COVID and, and the fact that we're still not out of this yet. Uh, you see what happens, Michelle, when I give you a few extra, <laughs> everybody <laughs> takes a few extra. Okay, Lauren Bruce, how about immigration? What's the NDP going to do? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I agree with almost everything Michelle said. And, uh, and Brian, you know, I've, what we've talked before, good policy is good policy. So a lot of the initiatives you've just put forward and, and the work you did, uh, I support as well. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of a different spin on this because uh, there are issues with accreditation and we've been talking about it for years. And there are, I think that the Foreign Temporary Workers Program needs to be revamped and re-looked at. And I'd like to see it uh, change into a system that's a lot more flexible. So in other words, when we see uh, economic uh, situations where there's a, a downturn or an upturn, we have that flexibility so that we can actually, uh, for lack of a term, you know, direct those workers into those sectors that can most benefit from that program. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention about uh, immigration of foreign temporary workers is the agricultural workers here in Ontario and the situation that they've been in, especially under a pandemic. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware that uh, an agricultural worker that comes to Ontario uh, isn't treated the same as any other worker here in, in, in the province. They pay EI, they pay CPP, but they never collect it. And they don't have the same rights. So I think that has to be looked at as well. Okay, next question, back to Kristen. Good morning again. I'm, I'm going to tag on to Prakash's question there because this is really relevant in our workplace. Um, students that come over as foreign um, students, they are limited to 20 hours of work per week while they were in session. I'm sure that Brian May as MP would be aware that this creates an underground economy and that the students then seek cash payments for work over the 20 hour limit. Um, and they really need those hours to survive here and to be able to put a roof over their head and food on their plates while they study. What would your government be willing to do to help these students to survive and also not putting business in a position um, where in order to meet our needs to have employees as well as help them to be able to, to make it through their studies are put in a position of, of uh, not, not operating payroll the way we all know we should. Thank you. Michelle Brana. I uh, think this is a place where we need to really go upstream um, that what you've described, um, in addition to the, what you, you've indicated, I teach courses and my international students will skip class because they have to work. Um, and, and that makes it very hard to succeed in school when they don't come to class. So it, the, the reality is, um, you know, the, it's, it's really the whole system of post-secondary education. Um, the Green Party is, is looking at investing um, and, and, and moving towards uh, free post-secondary education so, so that uh, there's more government investment in education. Currently, the colleges and universities, they really re rely as in terms of a business model on international students to come in and pay tuition and that isn't the way that it should be so i'm not suggesting it should be free for international students i'm saying we can alleviate pr pressure if we have the post-secondary education system treated as an investment uh, ireland went basically kind of from the 18th century to the 21st century by having free post-secondary uh, education for the, 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 the residents of Ireland. Uh, so education, investing in people 
is 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 uh, is, is and we'll need to do a transition to do that. We'll need to cost that. I'm not saying we're going to instantly do that immediately, but I think, uh, Kristen, what you describe, as I said, I see the other side of that. I see these students under tremendous pressure. Um, in terms of their financial situation and and then and then failing their courses uh, and 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 so it's self defeating so so we need we need to kind of as as they say um you know the story about about upstream thinking you keep on pulling the babies out of the uh the river and you need to go upstream and see what's causing the problem and not sufficient uh investment in post secondary education in in those programs is 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 leading to a a problem where the, the these international students um, are are a uh, kind of um, uh, caught in, in 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 that system. Thanks, Michelle. Lauren Bruce. That's an excellent question. I'm in an industry that uh, deals with student employment on a regular basis. We uh, hire and hire and hire. We have a very high turnover rate in our industry, and uh, I've been in it over the years. Like I said, over 30 years. Um, I've seen students struggle. So the ones that are fortunate to get 20 hours, because a lot of them only get eight or 12 or less, uh, the ones that are uh, trying to work as much as they can, they reach a point where they, they burn out. And like Michelle was saying, then their, their studies suffer. But, you know, in talking to them about, you know, how do they have the balance? Well, they've got such high student debt that they have to make a certain amount of money just to, just to make it through. And yet, to make it through their, their studies suffer so absolutely we need to look at programs to ease the student debt and uh, we have to start looking at minimum wage and just what exactly are these workers earning you know do they need three different jobs and a, you know uh, for example a job where i work you have to be available pretty much any time weekends afternoons you name it long weekends and uh it's tough for these students it really is mm -hmm. thanks lauren connie cody Well, these are all, again, good questions. Um, students are definitely one of the ones who's trying to go to school. They're trying to balance their uh, education to grow and as well as working part-time. And uh, that balance act is uh, very hard for them. And uh, we need to really look at that so that uh, these uh, increase their wages and offer opportunities for uh, better paying jobs. And, um, you know, Many international students and foreign workers arrive in Canada with aspirations to hopefully one day to stay here, develop uh, relationships and attachments so that they can actually um, work full time, stay here permanently and become permanent uh, Canadian citizens. And uh, so we need to monitor the temporary foreign workers program to ensure that it is, achieves its intended results. And that, um, you know, with newcomers and their families to uh, support the employers seeking to uh, to fill the vital gaps that we have within our systems. So, um, yeah, it's we do have to look at all their wages stuff that because affordability is one of the biggest things. As uh, costs go up, they need to find the wages. So we do have to look at the wage programs to ensure that they not only have wages, but the benefits needed for healthcare as well, so that they don't use out-of-pocket money for things that, um, and the sponsorship program is something else that should be uh, looked at and including their families and other families to help out as well. So all those things would help to improve the uh, wage programs for the uh, students. Thanks, Connie. Brian May. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. This is something that uh, over my time as an MP has, has come up and we've, we've, we've worked with, especially this past year and a half. Um, but but just, to, just to come back to the fact we're talking about international students, uh, international students that, that are coming here to Canada to, to go to school. Um, they're not coming here on a work visa. And the, the 20 hours that you identified is, is something that that program ha has evolved into, you know, quote unquote, allowing so that, that, that they're not kind of circumventing the rules and, and, and uh, uh, breaking the law. Uh, by, by, by earning some extra money on the side. Um, if you're suggesting that they should be here on both a, a, a student visa and a work visa, that's a whole other conversation. And I, and I, and I would argue that you know, one of the principles of, of coming to, to Canada to be able to, uh, to take advantage of our amazing uh, educational institutions is that you have the means to do so. 
right? So a lot of times people are coming here with uh, uh, being sponsored by their, their uh, countries of origin. Um, and in many cases are receiving scholarships uh, to come here. And I think the key is that we uh, focus on what those pathways are for them when they graduate. Are there, cha are there challenges? Absolutely. And we need to make it easier uh, for students that want to stay in Canada to, to have that pathway to stay in Canada and, 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 and not just be educated here, but, but to be able to contribute to our community. Um, but I, I think that the idea of having both a, a student visa and a work visa at the same time uh, for these folks has been something that we've, uh, we've, we've struggled with, especially this last year and a half. Um, and we've, we've worked with students uh, to, to get them actually uh, the, the, the um, uh, permission to be able to work, uh, to work these full-time hours. Um, but having that as an overarching uh, principle, I think would be problematic, not just for their studies, uh, but also uh, what are they actually coming here for? Are they coming here to learn? Are they coming here to work? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Okay, next question, Terry Crotz. Thanks, Greg. Uh, my, my question was about uh, future support for small business. I think um, uh, business organizations have been ad advising and at the table somewhat with government uh, over the last year and a half, uh, trying to get us through this pandemic. Uh, but without a doubt, um, uh, a lot of people are still saying that, that we're not there yet. Um, and there, there may be a need for more support. And, and certainly for my work as a public accountant, I, I can see uh, some, some of my smaller business clients uh, uh, still have their life savings invested and, and still certainly are gonna need some help uh, to go forward and to stay in business and keep people employed <clears throat> from here on. And so just, to, just a general question about what is, what is your party uh, have planned to, to support businesses or small business, I should say, maybe maybe now and in the future. Thanks, Terry. Uh, let's start with Lauren Bruce from the NDP. Well, you're absolutely right, Terry. I don't believe it's over either. And I think we need to look at extending some of the supports that have been already offered out there to small business groups. Um, you know, so we need to, to, to look at and be flexible enough to to do what we need to do for as long as we need to do it. Um, when we look at the way to rent subsidies, uh, I think those are critical to, to small businesses. Also, uh, we're lo looking at a, you know, like a hiring bonus so that if you're a hired employee, the EI and CP part of the uh, payment would be paid for to, to help retain that employee. Um, and now this is a kind of a ripple effect of but what we really want to see is a universal farmer care program. Uh, not only is it the right thing to do for Canadians, uh, for those who can't afford to, to fill out their prescriptions or, or, or take their medicine, but it also helps businesses in the fact that it uh, takes out a lot of the cost of the extended benefits that, that they offer some of their employees. So I think that would be a, a key thing to, to help out as well. So, you know, I always say that uh, uh, the best uh, job creator is a, is a customer base that can actually afford to buy your goods and services. So if everybody is, uh, or people are struggling to pay their rent, or struggling to pay their mortgage, or they're working a precarious gig, uh, contract job, uh, they're not spending money in the, in the local economy. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is all, it's a, it's a holistic approach to, to, to all of these issues. But uh, you're absolutely right. Um, like I said before, I'm a cautious optimist when it comes to the economy. And uh, I think we need to be flexible enough to, uh, to continue to help businesses in this in this tough time thanks lauren um connie cody um you know our long-term uh, benefits for our businesses is really important because uh, they're the backbone of our community businesses are the ones who uh where hire the people so that they can pay their bills and uh we have to make life more affordable for people and uh, when I speak to uh, business leaders, I'm hearing that their concerns around uh, are the need to restart the economy and reduce a lot of red tape. And uh, those are one of the things that we need to do is uh, get rid of all that uh, red tape. And the definition of affordability is something that is uh, a price that's low enough that most people have enough money to buy it. 
and even purchasing a home or even slipping uh, or renting, slipping out of uh, reach for most Canadians across the country. So it, it's time to face the fact that we have a housing crisis in Canada. So with that, we have to look at getting as many people back to work as possible so they can pay their bills and the ever increasing utility costs. And uh, so right now we, we've got millions of Canadian workers that uh, in small or uh, business and uh, we, we need to have the plans. And so right here is we have the uh, Canada, Canada job search plan. We want to pay back 50% of the salary of new hires for six months. We want to uh, focus on the people who have been out of jobs longer term, more than a year, have better incentives for the employers to hire them back because it's harder for the ones who've been uh, out of work the longest to get back into the workplace. And as a top priority, that's what we need to do is get the people back to work and in jobs. And um, this is where the business needs to help our people. And so our government needs to help the uh, businesses. And uh, the other thing that's being offered by the Conservatives is to be, uh, rebuild uh, Main Street tax credit, which is providing 25% tax credit on amounts of up to $100,000 that Canadians can personally invest in small business over the next two years. And that will help to get the uh, money flowing and uh, as well with the Main Street business loan, providing loans up to $200,000 to help small and medium businesses in hospitality and retail and tourism. Because we all know that during this pandemic that some businesses thrived, but the ones that are in the hospitality uh, areas and considered non-essential, they didn't do as well. And a lot of them closed. We have to help people who are struggling or actually had to close to be able to reopen because we need our entrepreneurs back to create more jobs for the people to be more self-sustainable in our community. Thanks, Connie. Brian May. Thanks, Greg. Uh, providing supports for small businesses has been has really been the backbone of, of, of our plan over the last year and a half. Uh, really trying to make sure that, that we bring everybody along with us and, and whether it be the wage subsidy uh, that supported uh, over 5 million employees, whether it's the SEBA loans, which supported over 900,000 small businesses and businesses, rent subsidies, um, and, and of course, sectoral specific uh, support. Uh, but, but the question is, what are we doing moving forward? And, and I think all the candidates have said, you know, we're not done. We can't be done. And, and we have said over and over again, we're, we're not going to leave people behind. Uh, we need to continue uh, with our plan. Uh, we're going to extend the Canada Recovery Hiring Program to March 31st of 2022. So businesses can hire more workers and Canadians can, can get back uh, on the job. Uh, we're going we're gonna to focus in on those that, that, that need it the most. And, and I think, you know, we can agree that, you know, tourism is an example of, of one of those industries. And we're going we're gonna to work with them um, with the temporary wage and rent support up to 75% of their expenses and help them get through, help them get through this winter. Um, we're going we're gonna to look at, at technology and uh, create the, the Canada Digital Adoption Program with, uh, with grants for small businesses to, to, to move into the digital space. Um, and things such as the Canada Small Business Financing Program, increasing annual financing by an estimated six, uh, $560 million, supporting um, thousands of additional small businesses getting them uh, moving forward and, and, and out of this, uh, out of this pandemic. Uh, you know, we need everybody to come along with us. Um, and one last thing, and I think this may sound like a bit of a reach, but $10 a day childcare, $10 a day childcare is, uh, is not just a, a, a social program. This is going to support small businesses across this country, being able to get the talent they need uh, and and uh, and and really create uh, that workforce that, that that that's necessary moving forward. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Michelle Brannon. So I think there's broad consensus of continuing the support, the pandemic supports until the pandemic's really over. Uh, the Green Party uh, is in favor of a, a green recovery plan, not just an economic recovery plan, but a green recovery plan. And a big part of that has to do in social innovation, there's recognition that that old story, that the economy and markets are a machine and government just primes the pump and then, and then somehow money trickles down and everyone gets a share. It's not a machine. Um, it's a social system. It's more like an ecosystem. And that means government is like a farmer or like a gardener. So it's up to the gardener to create conditions that local 
businesses will flourish, will be prosperous, um, that local communities will be resilient. So some of the things the Green Party is, is looking at is for, for one, small business tax rate no more than 9%. And no new legislation passed unless you look at the impact on small business, get it, also getting rid of red tape. So, so you can't have rules that apply to all sizes of business because scaling is, is important when it comes to business. Um, in that economic recovery plan, that green recovery plan that we're advocated, there would be investment in green innovation. And that's happening in Cambridge now um, on its own. So um, the R&D in internationally, the standard of countries like Canada is about 2.5% of the gross domestic product. And we need to get up to that level. We need to have grants. Um, we need to have the internet. Uh, broadband internet, also in rural areas, and it, it, it needs to be uh, affordable. And, and there's a whole lot of things that we can do in terms of supporting um, farming as, as a business in, in, in terms of land trusts. So, so we, we, we need to uh, um, have government take a role uh, like a farmer in, in a garden and create conditions for the small business and medium businesses to prosper and for communities and people to be resilient and healthy. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, I'm gonna cut you back to a minute and a half to answer the questions now so we can get to your closing remarks. Uh, Peter Voss, give us a really tough question. You're, uh, you're, you're gonna get one. Uh, so I'm, I'm, gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take one of uh, Greg's questions. We talked about these before. So this is about uh, affordable housing. And I do wanna make a, a, a statement that I think people confuse the the right uh, to home ownership to the right to shelter. I, I don't believe people have a right to own a home. Um, you know, we want to make homes as affordable as we can, but I don't think it's a right that everyone has a home um, that they own. Um, if you look at something like in Europe, most people don't own their homes and they're, they're perfectly uh, happy. So I think it's a right for shelter, not a right for, for home ownership. You know, we have the party saying, you know, 1 million homes, 1.4 million homes, 500,000. Some say nothing about housing. Um, I believe only one talks about affordable housing, which no one adequately defines what is affordable. You know, what's affordable to you may not be affordable to me, but nobody defines that. But one of the issues is uh, obviously a supply, right? And uh, the developers um, in Ontario specifically are restricted by antiquated legislation, regulatory requirements at the uh, municipal, regional and provincial levels um, that actually inhibit them to build affordable and subsidized housing still make money you know, and solve this problem for the Canadian communities. So what is your party's solution um, that won't hurt the value of people who currently own homes um, and doesn't pass the cost of that, that program onto the general tax taxpayers? Connie Cody. Okay, yeah, ho housing is something that is uh, really near and dear to my heart. I've been a housing advocate for uh, many years. I've had to experience seniors couch surfing in attics and basements and uh, suffering the heats and unavailable, to, uh, un unable to pay their bills. Um, I've seen where people who are on a disability and especially again, seniors on their low pensions who, um, you know, they couldn't even afford their diabetic needles. And at uh, Christmas time or even throughout the year, they're doubling up the usage of their needles because of um, they wanted to buy that gift or buy food put on the table. And uh, that's not the way that our society should be. We have to actually look and focus on our seniors and even our younger generations right now. Housing is, uh, when I'm going around and talking to people and housing is very unaffordable to them. And uh, it's very discouraging for them. They're wondering about how are they ever going to buy their house? Are they ever going to have a home for their family, a backyard, a place to live? Or are they going to be continuously living with their parents? And like what actually happens? So we do need a new approach on how ha housing is done. And afford affordability is the key so that people can retain their housing. And uh, 
I've done a lot of research over the years and spoken with a lot of people on housing and the past processes and policies have not been working. A lot of them go back to the 1980s and as you can see, homelessness has only increased throughout time and people have suffered. We see more and more of the complaints and people who have worked their whole entire life and who receive a pension can no longer afford to pay and life experiences didn't prepare them for the inflation and the higher debts that uh, they're experiencing right now. So, um, you know, we have opportunities. We have a, a available to um, look at opportunities here that uh, allow further building and increase of supply, because a lot of it is a supply and demand issue. And we have to look not at past grant rather policies and development. We have to look at new ways of how we can actually create housing to fit more people in there. And that's where we have to work closely with our smaller medium developers and also with our landlords because they are the two resources that can help people to get into housing. And uh, without them, uh, it doesn't move forward. And sometimes government gets in the way and uh, I'm going to get, I'm talking too long, obviously, it's an issue here, but we do have to increase the supply and uh, we plan on uh, building 1 million homes to reduce the, uh, um, to increase the supply. And we need to get rid of the unnecessary roadblocks preventing Canadians from getting these mortgages. So uh, the other thing we're going to do is stop foreign investment into foreign investors buying homes for the next two years in Canada if they don't live and work here. So all of this should increase supply and get people in homes, which is, should be a priority. All of the time you had in the bank, Connie, you used up on that that one. So, uh, Brian May. Uh, thank you, Peter, for this this question. This has been the cornerstone of, of my career as an MP is, is affordable housing in Cambridge. We, we went through a generation where the federal government simply was not involved in affordable housing. And you're right, there are two concepts here. It's about making housing affordable and providing affordable housing for those in need. Two very different conversations. The on the, in terms of providing housing for those in need, we have stepped into that place. And I don't think there can be any argument that, that we have invested heavily uh, in what's called the National Housing Strategy. It's a 10-year plan. It was launched in 2017. It'll invest over $72 billion to build supply, making housing affordable, and address chronic homelessness. We help more than 2 million Canadians through new builds, repairs, renovations, uh, and rental subsidies. And uh, you know, there, I, I could go on and on about that, but I think your real question is about uh, how do we make uh, housing affordable for all? And uh, you know, whether whether or not somebody should have the right uh, to, to to buy a home or not is 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 really not the issue. The issue is the fact that the the uh, the, the market is absolutely skyrocketing. A year and a half ago, I met with uh, uh, key stakeholders in the real estate industry who were telling me the market was going to crash because of COVID. We were gonna see 25% reduction in housing because people weren't gonna be able to afford it and people aren't gonna be able to view homes property because of lockdowns. The opposite happened. We saw a 50% swing the other way. So we need to, uh, we need to look at how do we, what's causing that? Um, we're, we're going to uh, help those uh, get into a first time home buying situation. Uh, we're gonna introduce uh, a new tax free first uh, home savings account, which I think is going to revolutionize that. Um, we're also going to uh, increase uh, double uh, the tax credit uh, from 5,000 to 10,000 for first time home buyers. But we also have to look at what's causing these prices to skyrocket. Um, we need to build more homes. Uh, I agree with Connie. Our plan calls for 1.4 million new homes. Um, we are going to invest uh, 4 billion in new housing accelerator fund. Um, we're going to uh, look at uh, some of the causes like foreign speculation, blind bidding, and uh, uh, curb that speculation and house flipping that is really causing this uh, to, 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 to skyrocket. Um, I, I could go on and on, Greg, but I'm getting the, I'm getting the hook, so I will respect that. Um, but this, this is the, the, the affordable housing piece has been my key pro, pro, uh, uh, priority. And, and all you have to do is look around this community to see the number of affordable housing projects that we've built in the last six years. Well, I'm sure glad I cut everybody back to a minute and a half, but uh, Michelle Branham, go ahead. <clears throat> so uh, yes, the National Housing Strategy Act, Brian, it's, it's, uh, it was a landmark and I gotta say it's a good start. Um, it's not fast enough. Uh, that, that 
that um, housing policy said that affordable housing, having a place to sleep that is secure is a human right. And, and we really need to make sure that it happens. By the way, I teach, um, I teach uh, social policy courses. Waterloo Region is among the top five in Canada. So it's bad here, but we're the best of, of a bad lot, I suppose. But um, it, it, we, we're, we're ahead of the game and it's because Waterloo Region as a municipality was pretty progressive in its policy. So having the national support is key. Um, the uh, National Housing Strategy Act has provisions for a federal housing advocate. We need that in place now. Um, the Green Party is in favor of calling affordable housing a national emergency, and that, that lets things happen much more quickly. So investing in affordable, uh, nonprofit, cooperative, and supportive housing. So supportive housing is social workers, social service workers available to advocate to support people because a lot of the people who need affordable housing might have mental health, other health addiction issues. The only uh, supportive housing in uh, Cambridge is the second floor of the bridges. And that is not, that's only, uh, that's, that's, that's a shelter, right? So as compared to Elmira and Kitchener where there's actual units that are available with uh, social services attached. So yes, we need to accelerate the construction of affordable housing. And one of the things the Green Party says we should do is refocus the core mandate for CMHC so that it, it, it can get into funding um, uh, affordable housing. Also uh, evidence-based po government policy. So uh, lots of voters in Cambridge have been sending me emails about votehousing.ca. It's evidence-based, lots of uh, research recommendations. Government needs to, you know, to listen to those grassroots and, 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 and follow through on them and certainly get, get moving. And um, I agree that the um, market, uh, not be for people to buy homes, but because it affects the pricing for affordable housing also needs to be addressed. Thanks, Michelle and Lauren Bruce to wrap things up on this question. Well, wow, housing, huge. Uh, a number of years ago, probably approaching eight or so, I was having consultations with the local mayors and municipalities in the region and housing was identified as one of their number one concerns. So they were already seeing the issues that was happening in their own jurisdictions, whether it was the land availability, development, or just the need. Uh, from a personal level, I can share this with you folks that my little one, she's 25 and her partner have been trying to get into the market and she is beside herself frustrated because she can't get in. Uh, about a month ago, she looked at a house in Cambridge and before she could make an appointment, five bids were in and it was gone, it was off the market. Completely priced out of it. And then my own personal situation, where I was happy as a clam coming home from work one day and my landlord walked up to me and said, uh, by the way, uh, my elderly parent needs to move in here and here's your notice. I was suddenly thrust into the rental market and shocked. Well, I already had a pretty good idea, but because I was in uh, such a need to find somewhere in such a short period of time, the availability. I was uh, online, I was driving neighborhoods, I was going all across the region, I was going as far up as uh, Baden, anywhere, I was living in Cambridge at the time, and there was just no availability, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. And when I did find something, well, it was just beyond my price. It was just not affordable, it was just not gonna happen. So uh, I have personal experience with it, and this has been an issue for a long time, and, uh, we need, to, and, that, and then, you know, like we were talking about the price of housing just skyrocketing. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, uh, you know, the foreign investors looking at uh, our housing market as a stock market. And I think we need to put uh, uh, the clamps on that activity. So. Thanks, Lauren. You know what, I had this all timed down. And then, of course, you know, as politicians will do at times, they always throw you off just a tiny little bit when you're trying to, you know, it's like hurting cats, I guess, to some degree. But got to give you a shot to give your last pitch, uh, give you a minute. And I'm going to be hard with the minute uh, because we want to get people back to work. So let's start off in reverse order from what we started. Let's start off with Brian May. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. 
Canadians have experienced a once in a generation pandemic. Uh, the choices that the gov federal government made played a huge role in our resilience through COVID-19. So we, as we finish the fight against COVID-19, let's build back better together. Our record speaks for itself while others were advocating for austerity or advocating against masks or against vaccinations or against helping those who need it, we were fighting for you. Our recovery is working and we've supported Canadians from financial uh, and, and employment related pressures through it all. Canadians can choose to continue with a proven plan, our plan, and we can keep making progress. Let's put Canadians health and safety first. Let's build more homes for the middle class and end profiteering and unfair speculation. Let's support families and give every child $10 a day childcare. Let's fight climate change and leave a safe and healthy environment for our grandchildren. Let's build a better future that gives everyone a real and fair chance at success. That's why I need your vote on September 20th. Thank you. Thanks, Brian and Connie Cody. Well, it's been my pleasure to have the opportunity to convey the Conservative platform to the Cambridge Chamber of Commerce and uh, community this morning. And uh, we're worried that millions of Canadian workers and small businesses are being left behind. It's time for a government with a jobs plan that will deliver. I will be your advocate in Ottawa. I will be visible, engaged, and responsive to the business community and ensure their needs are heard. We're here to make Canada the best place to invest and build a business. My whole life, I have worked to be engaged in the Cambridge community and know I have the strength and resilience to get the job done that you expect of me. I am more of a doer, not a talker. And to me, the importance is on rebuilding this community and our economy. At the end of the day, we have a plan, a real plan, a detailed, simplified plan to bring back jobs, help our business, to rebuild our country stronger than ever before. For this election, vote Conservative. Vote for a plan that won't throw money at problems, but puts it towards real solutions. Vote for someone who cares, who places people before politics. Vote for me, Connie Cody. Thanks, Connie. Lauren Bruce. I'd like to thank, thank you, Greg, for inviting us today. Uh, like I said before, uh, given the challenges of a, an election during COVID, I really appreciate every platform we can get out and talk to folks. Um, I just I want to talk a little bit about uh, me as a, a member of parliament. I quite often say that I'm applying for the job to be your MP. So this is like the biggest job interview uh, someone would go through. Because ultimately, I answer to the folks of Cambridge. If they're going to hire me, that's who I answer to. And I've spent decades lobbying different levels of government, quite often about the same things, whether it's the blue team in office or the red team, you know, fighting for uh, a national daycare system, a national pharmacare system, you know, election reform, uh, increases to the Canada Pension Plan, all of the, the things that people have been talking to me over, over the years. So I will continue that fight. I'm not afraid to speak truth to power. And I'd also just like to talk from an economic point of view. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what an amazing place Cambridge is and the potential. We are the gateway to Waterloo Region. We are, you know, we, we often talk in business about location, location, location. Well, we are in the perfect location in Southwestern Ontario. We are smack in the middle for a, to be a transportation hub, uh, a huge manufacturing base, and I will absolutely be promoting those things and, uh, and be a champion for uh, Cambridge. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Little latitude to you because that's the first time you went over your time, actually. So, uh, Michelle Branham. So, Parliament needs green voice. The green uh, members of provincial and federal parliament always kick more than their weight, make a big difference. Uh, we're grassroots, evidence based, we listen, and we're all about sustainability and innovation. And I think if this were a job interview, I'd ask you to reflect on the way I've answered the questions. I think that it, it reflects my years of practice as a lawyer, as a mediator, my years as an entrepreneur with small business. I was a manager in the nonprofit sector, specifically in mental health. 
and have background and uh, studies in social innovation. I teach courses in social policy. I am the most qualified person to be your member of parliament if this was a job interview. And the Green Party recognizes that Canada is more than resources and markets. It's people who live on the land with waterways. It's a living planet. Uh, we need a green recovery plan. We need the, the government to create conditions for healthy, resilient, prosperous peoples, family and community. Vote for me if you care about your grandchildren's grandchildren. Thanks very much, Michelle. You know what? I, let me tell you something. This should have been on national television as this is Cambridge. Not what we saw on national television out in front of a business in Cambridge a couple of weeks ago with Mr. Trudeau in town. This is Cambridge. Civility, honesty, integrity from our people running for public office, um, having a good dialogue, not yelling and screaming at each other and calling each other names. That's exactly what those of us out here who are going to cast our ballot want to see from our local representatives. We want you to be reflective of our community. And our community is a caring, uh, interesting, uh, and full of debate community, uh, but we want civility first and foremost. We want ethics uh, as to be a principle of every one of our elected officials. And so we thank you this morning, all of you, Brian, Lauren, uh, Michelle, and Connie for coming on. We certainly appreciate the time that you've spent with us and good luck. Uh, September 20th is election day. Everybody get out there and vote uh, uh, for someone. Um, and hopefully you'll vote for one of the four that actually took the time uh, to come on today. So thank you very much, folks. Have a great day. Thank you to my board members, Kristen, uh, Terry, Peter, Darren, and Prakash, who participated. Can't do this job without you folks and uh, my board of directors, <clears throat> probably the best board of directors of any organization in the world. Uh, they're very supportive and just great people. So thank you very much as well. Have a great day, folks.